Hey guys, and welcome to the OC3D TV review of the Intel i9-7980XE 18-core processor. Does XE mean Xeon? Hey guys and welcome to another one of my CPU reviews and today we're going to be taking a look at the 18 core behemoth that is the 7980XE. Now before this we've only really had up to 10 core processors, even 10 cores are quite a recent thing really. So for us to go 8, that was a big deal, then 10, this sudden leap to 18 is quite a large statement. And the XE kind of name instantly makes me think of Xeon anyway. Now something that you may you need to know is um, uh, when it does come to the way CPUs are made, the way they do them is they make a big batch and they may all look the same. And then essentially what happens is they get binned off. And depending on how they get graded depends on what process it ends up making. So. Some of you out there may have, or may be lucky enough, or mad enough, however you would like to respond to the internet community about um, uh, your purchase, you may have a 7900X. Lucky enough to have a 7900X, but there could be the rest of the cores underneath that bit of silicon that could have been the 7900XE in the first place. It could actually mean that over the period of them being um, uh, made, they've kept all of the ones that uh, all 18 cores worked, and that then turned into the 7900XE. And that's pretty much the way it's worked all along. Now we have had 18 core Xeons in the past. You can get 22 core Xeons now. Um, I'm pretty sure that we're gonna see the, the core counts climb a little bit more, but the long and short of it is, what, what is it that we've got now? Now we've got a 3.3 gigahertz processor that can turbo up to 4.4. Now I did regularly see kind of 4.2 with the odd core whizzing all the way up to the 4.4 gigahertz uh, but the, the, the you do need everything to kind of fit in and be all right. One thing that I did notice though uh, because just to let you know I'm using the X299A for the review because that's what I reviewed all of the other um, uh, 2066 processors on. That makes it kind of fair. But it also, when you uh, break things down, it also kind of makes it a bit unfair in the, same, in the same breath because I'm using what is essentially an entry level board for a very, very high end processor. Now, when I reviewed the Threadripper board, I obviously, sorry, when I reviewed the Threadripper processor, I got sent by AMD the Zenith, which is the top end board from Asus at this pro present moment in time to review it on. So with this, I don't know, I just stuck with the lowest end one because that's genuinely where I go for my CPU reviews. Now I will explain how that may have been a slight limiting factor later on and also at the end when we get to the conclusion I will talk to you about how you know it may not be the best choice for you if you're looking to do certain things but at the same time it all really comes down to the graphs. And when it comes with the processor itself, like I said, it's an 18 core processor. There's not really a great deal that I need to whiz through with you. You need to know about all the numbers. So keeping in mind that the, uh, uh, the board is the limiting factor, we'll start to talk about overclocking before I show you the graphs because we have the, um, uh, the uh, uh, we've got stock and overclocked in the graphs. Also, what I do want to let you know is the overclocked results that are in this graph for the competition AMD processor were my four gigahertz results that I got with my um, engineering sample. I now don't have that engineering sample and uh, my retails will only do 3.8, but I've left the better results in the graph just to give you a bit of balance because there do seem to be two very clear um, batches of CPUs out there at the moment or two very clear um, different you know overclocks that are available so I've left the four gigahertz ones in the graph just so that you know as far as Threadripper is concerned it's the best results I've had it's just sadly the processor that I've not uh, got left anymore 
So, when I bring the uh, Cinebench result up, what we can see here is there's a fairly big difference at the top. So, essentially, why is there a big difference at the top? Well, uh, when it came to overclocking, what I did is I always work up slowly to see where I got. Now, uh, at stock, it was 18 cores and it was the volts are move, uh, sorry, the cores are moving around all over the place, but it never went above um, uh, a, a one volt, essentially. So then what I did is I, uh, I set my volts manually to a single volt and I wanted to see how high I could, I turned all the turbo in off, I wanted to see how high I could get all of the cores um, up to at a volt. And I could get four gigahertz on all 18 cores at one volt. That was with the load line calibration going up to about one point, sorry, 1.05-ish, um, but one volt essentially. So then I put it up to 1.1 and wanted to see how far I could get from there. At 1.1 volts, dead, I got 4.4 gigahertz across all of the cores. You need to remember this is up from 3.3. .3. So then, what I then did is I moved it up to, I wanted to see how far I could get the processor up to, and I could get 4.6 gigahertz easily, but I couldn't get it 100% stable. It was falling over in a Blender was the worst one, because uh, Blender's very stressful, maxes all the cores out, it picks up on any little issues. So uh, I backed it off to 4.5 gigahertz, which I managed to get stable at 1.175 volts. Yes, one, less than 1.2 volts for 4.5 giga, gigahertz across all 18 cores. Um, now, the only thing that I did have to do is because of the X299A, it's only got a single tiny heatsink on the VRMs, and I'll show you the power graph in a bit, but it was having to, it, it, the VRMs were working very hard, so I did have to put a little fan over the top to keep the temperatures down. At stock, the VRMs were, at, even with, uh, so at stock, even with the AVX on Prime, we were looking at 70 degrees on the, uh, on the VRMs. That's with the AVX run because uh, you've got three versions of Prime. There's 26, 28, and 29. 26 is kind of is the one without AVX. The 28 is the one with AVX, and 29 is AVX 512. 29 is the literally the worst thing that you can put on your processor as far as generating heat is concerned. And on uh, 29, it was 70 degrees at stock. So I didn't think that was too bad, but when we then moved on to the overclock and pumping all the extra volts in, and you'll see that it ended up pulling a lot more power with the overclock as well, then I had to have a fan on it. And then the temperatures were, with the fan were about 90. Uh, without the fan, it did tip over that point. But obviously we're using an entry level board and clearly if you're gonna spend 2000 pound on a processor, you'd wanna get, um, a, you might want to get a better board if you are gonna be overclocking. And I would say that if you're gonna be overclocking, you need a board with the additional heat sink on the VRMs and then you're not gonna to have to worry too much about direct cooling uh, and you should be able to set up your system quite uh, quietly as well. So bringing the graph back up, now you know that we benched at uh, 4.5 gigahertz, and that was with 3200 megahertz memory as well, because again, limiting factor, the board, if you go uh, much above 3200 with the A, the scores will start to drop off. So, I'm just gonna show you the Cinebench run. You can, uh, you can look at the big step at the top, but you can also, uh, di you can also digest where the stock settings come in, and I think it's done fairly well. Blender again, I mean, uh, this was all about the shortest amount of time possible, because this is the amount of time it took to do the renders. It's a three million polygon uh, custom render that we do here, and um, it's absolutely yomped off into the distance. I can't uh, stress enough about the difference with the Threadripper overclock as well. That was four gigahertz and not 3.8, because these are my initial results with the engineering sample. Um, so they are they are much better than what I can get with the uh, the retail stuff that I've got now. X two six five. To be honest with you, the um, the Intel stuff has always been strong on this, but this is more to show you the difference between the stock and the overclock than try and compare it to anything else. 
3D Mark, it did really well at stock, but it didn't do that well. Um, um, it did really well overclocked, it didn't do that well at stock. Uh, and it was a fairly similar thing with PC Mark 7. Now I've mixed this in to uh, give you some balance because not every benchmark <clears throat> Uh, ab you know, loves this sort of thing. And it's really clear to see here that PC Mark 7, for example, absolutely loves the AMD offering. Um, and then uh, at the end, the power draw. So with the power draw, I was getting about 370 watts from the wall being pulled at stock. And then that did go up to over 500 watts for the entire system being pulled from the wall um, uh, with the overclock. So roughly, uh, you're probably looking at about, actually probably about um, 370 watts just for the CPU being pulled when overclocked. Now, it does make a huge difference when you overclock it because uh, what you need to think about with the turbo is when you manually overclock, you are making all of the cores sit at that. Uh, rather than them moving around. And that's uh, another reason why the um, power draw and the temperatures go up as well, because you're essentially making the CPU work much harder. Now, I can say that I was absolutely gobsmacked how easy this was to overclock at low volts, and to be fair, how high that I could get it as well. I think uh, with the current market, 4.2 with decent volts would have been absolutely amazing um, and if I'm completely honest about it as well at 4.4 gigahertz um, I was getting I could test on this board without the fan on the VRMs and the CPU at uh, the hottest core was 68 degrees at 4.4 gigahertz with all 18 cores so this is also remembering that this isn't a soldered CPU either so the best thing I can, as far as it possibly being a Xeon, I think it genuinely has to be because Xeons are normally the ones where they don't use a lot of power and they are ridiculously cool as well. And I, I, this kind of performs better than the 7900X that I've got thermally. So the, 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 how well this works is absolutely kind of annoying. And what you also need to remember is, is I've purposely hampered it with this board because I have the Rampage. So yes, I have the Rampage and it is fully built as well. I could easily have just dropped the processor into this. This is the Cooler Master H500P, by the way. Uh, NDA is the 10th of October. I'm not allowed to review it until then. But I do, I did have the ability to make the tests essentially even better but I've stuck to the way I, I prefer to test, which is going back to the original board, and uh, we're gonna do that. I may do, if there's enough interest in the comments underneath, I may go back and drop the, um, the processor into this. Um, I'm also, just to let you know, I'm going to see 8-pack at EGX, which I leave for, and uh, before this video actually gets to go live, crazily enough, but I'm going to uh, EGX because I'm going to delid the uh, 7980 XE as well. And then I'm going to go back and do some tests again. So the temperatures are going to drop even further. But anyway, the long story short is it's actually the power. Yes, it does draw quite a bit of power, but it, you know, you do just have to, when it comes to power, you do just have to keep in mind about cooling the VRMs because it's not particularly about how much power it's pulling from the wall, it's just the byproduct. And if you put all of that wattage through VRMs, you, you, the byproduct is heat, so you do have to dissipate it. The top end boards like this, the Apex, um, uh, the Gigabyte uh, do one with an extra um, heat sink around the side, MSI X Power do it as well. You're gonna need to keep that in mind if you're planning on overclocking. Um, now, the, 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 the kind of, the, really the wolf in the room, whatever the saying is, is about the price. It's 2,000 pound and there's gonna be lots and lots of people underneath shouting about Threadripper being half the price. And I would agree with you, Threadripper is half the price. Partly, those people shouting about Threadripper being half the price is the reason why I did just stick with the um, 299A and didn't go with this. And I stuck to the kind of normal 
testing mythology, even though I don't think you would ever buy the X299A and stick an 18 core 2000 pound processor in it. But when it does come down to, half the price will be completely honest. If you're worried and you're arguing about Threadripper being half the price, then you've already made your mind up. I'd also go as far as to say, I don't think anyone that's gonna be moaning about one being half the price of the other, I don't think the people that are actually moaning about it would have actually been interested in the uh, 18 core madness anyway. It's an extremely niche product because it is so ridiculously expensive. And really it's all going to come down to how much are you willing to pay for your processor? If you are just forgetting about price and you're just looking for possible performance, then you have a very clear indicator in the graphs. At stock, it uses less power than the uh, Threadripper and pretty much comes in around the same sort of performance that I got with the Threadripper with its four gigahertz overclock. If you go like for like, so stock for stock, then the Intel's pretty much in front by a margin in every single graph. Is that margin big enough to um, bring in a double price? Well, that's really only ever going to be a question that you can answer for yourself. Um, because at the end of the day, if I say you should buy this, or I say you should buy that, that's not particularly my kind of um, uh, my job because I'm not going to know your specific circumstances. The, um, the graphs are there for you to, to, to decide on. No matter what you do or say though, yes, £2,000 is an obscene amount of money, but it does buy you what is essentially one of the most ridiculous processes on the planet at this given moment in time. The fact that it did manage to do those things um, CPU thermals, I mean, at 4.5 gigahertz with normal off-the-shelf cooling, no water cooling, no special block, I was able to keep the temperatures below 80 degrees with, like I said, easily off-the-shelf stuff, not having to buy anything with a special plate or anything like that. And it did do it really well. Now, why, while we may be kind of saying um, 80 degrees, and I know there are going to be people shouting at the screen that um, the Threadrippers and the Ryzen's don't ever get that hot, uh, you would be correct, but at the same time, they work in very different ways as well. So with the uh, Ryzen and the Threadripper ones, they do actually have a lower threshold. That um, The reason why the temperatures are lower is because if they got to 80 degrees, they would probably shut off and blue screen, whereas these sort of ones are kind of happy. Although they are happy, I'm not necessarily particularly that happy about it. But anyway, it kept it at a temperature um, with easily off the shelf stuff, even though it's got thermal uh, paste rather than um, soldering. And even though I was using it on, you know, not particularly the greatest board. And one thing that I did notice when I tested the Rampage with the normal 10 core, the 7900X, is I was amazed actually how much cooler that board made it compared to the other one. I have no idea why, it must just be cleaner power or something like that, but this did work wonders, which is why I'm gonna go back to it. But it's also why I'm when I uh, do go and see 8-pack and I've not seen Ian for a while, we're gonna do the D-lid. And that's not because I'm a shill or paid off by Intel. That's plain and simple because I want to know how much I can get out of this processor. It's a personal thing that I'm going to end up um, sharing with you. So this processor, do you want to know what? I'm not even going to give it an award. And the reason why I'm not going to give it an award because it genuinely, genuinely doesn't matter. I'm not not giving it an award because um, uh, I'm trying to hate on it or it's not good enough or anything like that. It's just because at the end of the day, the graphs speak for themselves. And I'm not gonna be getting grief from Intel about the fact that I didn't give in an award. To be honest with you, I asked Intel whether they wanted me to use the Rampage, because I was like, I'm, I, if I do this, am I gonna get in grief? And they were like, use whatever you want, Tom. Just whatever you want. So they, there was no specific requirements about boards or anything like that. It was just a case of, there's your processor, crack on, nice one, thanks very much. So, you can decide about, did I make the right choice by using that? Uh, are you interested in me using that? 
Is £2,000 too much? I would love to hear your thoughts underneath. And I'm hoping, because I'm pretty sure there is going to be an almighty tidal wave of people just going across every single video on YouTube moaning about it. I'm hoping if you bothered to watch the video that there is enough balance here and you can see that I genuinely tried to effectively not give that boy, that CPU, um, uh, you know, I could have made its life a lot easier and I've essentially made it work ridiculously hard and yet it still chomped out those graphs um, and did exceptionally, exceptionally well. So yes, it's a dream product, but to be honest with you, the dream product, and I think that's one of the reasons why it divides people because it does cost an awful lot of money, but a lot of us, if we're honest with ourselves, if it did come down to it, it would probably be the absolute dream processor that we would go for. Because let's face it, with overnight parts from Japan, it can and did decimate all.